Yeah, it's uh, now streaming live on YouTube. Oh, great. Okay. There are several people waiting to join uh, on our uh -huh. Zoom link. So as soon as we activate this YouTube, uh, we'll um, let them in. Sure. Not a problem. <clears throat> Done, sir. We are live on YouTube now. Okay. If you allow, uh, if you agree, I'll admit this participant now. Yeah, start admitting them. How many are there waiting? Uh, 17. 17. Let them in. Let them in. Yeah. It's <clears> open to <throat> the university campus, right? I can see many people logging in. Some are students, some are faculty. And uh, you will find many others watching through YouTube live. We cannot hear you. You have to unmute. You have to unmute yourself, uh, Sudhir. Yeah, yeah. It said that the host had muted me, but I was able to unmute. Okay. Oh, good, okay. Good. Okay. No, don't mute yourself now. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, because then, uh, because Dinesh has the control for okay. uh, unmuting now. So once you uh, unmute, uh, once you mute, uh, you'll have to get him to unmute you. <laughs> I see, I see, I see. Okay. Yeah, so don't unmute I won't now. Do that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, don't mute now. I'm sorry. <laughs> yep, yep. I can see a lot of people have logged in. Uh, so far, we've got about. Uh, Nilesh, sir, can you uh, click that raise hand? Pardon? Oh, yes. Can you uh, uh, raise my hand? Yeah. And so, this are also uh, on your screen, there is an option called raise hand. Can you just click that, please? Raise hand. Uh... Participants. Participants. And on the right hand yep. side, bottom corner, that option. I see invite participants. Oh, I have to click on participants. Yes, sir. Yes, no, no, raise hand. To, yeah, yeah. And then got raise it. Hand. Yeah. Yeah, got it. Yeah, yes. Uh, Dinesh, is my hand raised now? Yes, sir. Okay. And Sudhi is so also raised. So with this, yeah. I'll have both of your name all, always on the top of the list. Okay, good. So we have about 36 participants already on uh, Zoom who have logged in. Um, any idea about uh, YouTube, uh, Dinesh? Just to be, let me check, sir. Yeah, how many people are watching? Once we get some kind of critical mass, we'll start. Sure. Right now, only one uh, person is uh, on the YouTube. Mm. So they'll join in. On Zoom, we've got 39 people. Okay, in the meanwhile, while people are logging in, uh, yep. Sudhir, let me just uh, in introduce you to some of our colleagues here. Uh, sure. I can see uh, Dr. Xavier. Uh, Dr. Xavier uh, is the uh, head of our education program. Uh -huh. uh, we have a bachelor's in education. In fact, it's the oldest program of our university uh, because as you know, we have several schools also and we train uh -huh. teachers. So okay. uh, Dr. Xavier uh, heads that program. Uh, 
Uh, good morning, Dr. Xavier. Would you like to unmute your phone, uh, your speaker, and you can speak? Uh, Dinesh, I think, okay, I think. Uh, yeah, Dinesh has muted him, I think. And now yeah. we can, yes. Yeah, yeah. Hello, sir. Nice to see you. Hi. Uh, nice to hear from you. Hello, hello. Yeah, yeah. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, sir. Good morning. Nice to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, nice to be yeah. there. Then we have uh, Dr. Archana Tomar. Uh, she's also a faculty um, and she's heading our master's in social work program. Ah, okay. Uh, then morning, I can also sir. see, uh, good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Krishna, sir. Good morning. Good morning, Archana. How are you? So they're doing work on healthcare as well. Social work I on see. healthcare. Okay, great. Yeah. <clears throat> then we have Mr. Uh, Bipash Kumar Basu. He's a very senior uh, uh, gentleman who's joined us recently from uh, Larson and Tubro, uh, one of uh -huh. India's top engineering firms, where he was the vice president. Okay. Hello. Great. Good morning, Mr. Basu. Uh, I guess he has to unmute his phone. Um, anyway, we'll move on. Okay. And, um, I can see um, uh, Dr. Amrish, who is our head of the mechanical engineering program. Dr. Hello. Amrish. Good morning, sir. Welcome. Welcome. Thank to you. This. Hi. So uh, we also have Dr. Pradeep Behra. Uh, who manages the, who's uh, in the School of Management, uh, where he teaches his expertise in his supply chain management. Ah, excellent. Great. Then we have Dr. Elizabeth Robin. Uh, Elizabeth is in our life sciences program. We have a very strong life sciences program as well. Yeah, good morning, Great. sir. Good morning. And then I can see several students who have also logged in. Um, nope. Yeah, we have Lippi Butch, who's also a faculty in the uh, life sciences area. Great. Uh, sir, uh, sir, teacher ma'am has joined us. And I'd just like to give a shout out to a couple of my colleagues. I can see, I can see Dr. Sanjeev Bundy joining from Northern Australia there. Oh, okay. Out, yep. And I see online, I don't see him on video, Dr. Arif Swaminathan from uh, Phoenix. Oh, I see. Another Very colleague nice. of mine, yeah. yeah. Welcome, uh, Sanjeev and Swaminathan. So, so it's a truly global uh, program today. we got people Indeed. from all over Indeed. the world. <laughs> Indeed. Thanks for setting it up, Nilay. Yeah. And thanks for agreeing to speak to us. No problem. Okay. I think. Um, good morning, Tajan, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Mrs. Tejal Amin. She's the chairperson of our university and of our Navrachna Education Society. Where we have Great. schools, we also have the university. So she's the chairperson. Nice to meet you. Very nice meeting you, uh, Dr. Sudhir, and uh, thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us and our students and this larger audience. You're welcome. You're welcome. My pleasure. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I guess we can start now. We have about nearly 60 people who have joined in. Sure. The others can join sure. uh, via YouTube, I guess. Uh -huh. <clears throat> So, uh, good morning to all of you, and um, it's of course 10.30 in the night for uh, Sudhir, uh, where he's right now speaking from in California, and um, let me introduce you to Dr. Krishna Sudhir. Uh, Dr. Sudhir has done his MD uh, from the University of Madras. He's also done his PhD from the Monash University in Australia, and he has a lot of teaching experience as well. He has taught in Australia, 
uh, in places like the Baker Heart Institute, and he's also taught in the Alfred Hospital. Then he moved to the United States, where he did a fellowship in cardiology from the University of California in San Francisco. And subsequently, he moved to the industry. So it's a very interesting shift that one sees from a medical doctor to a teacher to industry. And in the industry, he was involved in several research projects. He's filed several patents. He's been awarded several patents. And uh, now he's in a leadership position in one of the world's topmost healthcare companies, Abbott Vascular. Uh, Sudhir is one of the leading cardiologists in the world, and he's responsible for the design of the next generation of stents in Abbott. He's also a teacher. He continues teaching, uh, where he teaches as a visiting professor at Stanford University and the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, Sudhir, incidentally, is a TED Ed speaker, and we'll talk about that too. You all must be knowing about TED Talks. There's a division of TED called TED Ed, and um, he basically speaks there to talk about various aspects of health, uh, you know, heart and other aspects, including aspirin and uh, very for the public. Um, and another very interesting part of him, which he's developed a few years ago, is his passion for writing and the creative side. So he's also an author, and he's published uh, a trilogy, fiction books, and uh, we will talk about that also as we move forward. On a personal note, Sudhir and I know each other for the past 50 years, five zero, 50 years, half a century. We were schoolmates. We've seen each other grow over the years. We've remained in touch. And Sudhir is a brilliant orat uh, orator also. And um, uh, you will learn a lot from him in today's session. Very multifaceted personality. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Krishna Sudhir, for joining us today in a conversation. Uh, and on behalf of Navrachana University in Varodra, India, I welcome you uh, very warmly to our university. Even though it's virtual, it's a very warm welcome. Thank you, Nile, and thank you for having, having me here. It's the joys of Zoom. I think, uh, you know, we are uh, currently in the grip of a pandemic, but one thing this pandemic has taught us is that we can function very effect, uh, efficiently via video conferencing. I think it's been good for Zoom and Skype and FaceTime and all these media. So uh, uh, brought to your university by Zoom, I should say. Um, and thank you for that very generous introduction. Uh, Nile was an outstanding orator himself. And uh, he and I represented our school, Don Bosco, uh, in Chennai, uh, went to various tournaments. And I think I still have a few trophies somewhere here that Nile helped bring home. <laughs> yeah, I remember those good old days. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Back to you. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, as you can see, you know, we, I've seen a very interesting growth path that you've had from yep. a teacher uh, uh, to industry. So can you tell us something about your teaching experience and that too in Australia? Sure, sure. So <clears throat> I left India shortly after graduating uh, uh, from Madras Medical College and two of my classmates, Dr. Sanjeev and Dr. Arif Swaminathan are on this call. Um, so I made my way to Australia at that time uh, uh, to do, uh, really to do some research. Uh, I did a PhD at the Baker Heart Research Institute and then moved over next door to the Alfred Hospital to complete my clinical training, um, got involved with teaching activities at uh, Monash University in, in the beginning, just teaching medical students uh, how to examine patients and so on. And that gradually evolved into uh, teaching residents. Uh, and then when I came to the US, I continued that teaching of cardiology fellows and so on. Um, having completed all my training, I was obviously uh, associated with universities all along. Uh, I happened to be in the Bay Area. I had graduated uh, in cardiology from the University of California, San Francisco, also known as UCSF. I stayed on, on faculty there for about seven years um, and again taught medical students, uh, residents in general medicine, and then fellows in cardiology. Uh, UCSF in the mid-90s had a merger with Stanford University, uh, not at the university level, but at the hospital level. So for about three years, a, the University of California Hospital and Stanford Hospitals functioned as one unit. 
So having an appointment at UCSF uh, brought me down to Stanford. Uh, that's where really my passion for innovation started because uh, Stanford, as you know, has a long history of innovation. I came into contact with many bright engineers, chemists, scientists, and so on, started chatting with them and eventually made the move to industry from there. So there was teaching at the Baker Institute, there was teaching at the Alfred Hospital, there was teaching at UCSF, and there was teaching at Stanford. And eventually the last of those experiences, the Stanford experience was what brought me to industry. Okay, so you made a very smooth shift to the industry as uh, yeah. one can see. So how did you find this difference between industry and um, um, uh, education? Yeah, so um, you know, uh, training as a cardiology fellow and then being on cardiology faculty, first at UCSF and then at Stanford, I came into contact with lots of people from industry, both on the pharmaceutical side as well as the medical device side. And both of them intrigued me because as physicians in practice, uh, we know about medications, we know about devices, but we're not that familiar with the pathway that creates them. So how is a drug discovered? Uh, how are mole uh, molecular compounds screened? Uh, how do you choose the right one to dose a patient with? How do you start a clinical trial? Uh, what are the phases that the drug goes through? Phase one, phase two, phase three in uh, drug trial research. And then on the medical device side, uh, as physicians, we <clears throat> implement these devices. So as a cardiologist, I was in the cardiac catheterization lab. I was around colleagues who were implanting stents, implanting pacemakers, using balloon dilatation catheters to open up coronary arteries. So um, I was curious about how these were uh, uh, originally discovered, uh, how patents were written for them, and then how startup industry got involved, how they were developed, how they moved to the uh, larger companies and how they became commercialized from there. It was all a big black box for me. I had no concept of how this was done. So initially it was curiosity. Um, you know, I was offering advice to people from industry but never really participating in drug or device development. So I wanted to make that transition and being a physician in the Silicon Valley made that transition relatively easy because in the Silicon Valley, there are a very large number of high-tech and biotech industries, as you know. There's probably, I haven't counted recently, but estimated to be about a thousand biotech industries between Santa Rosa, Santa Rosa up north and San Jose in the south. Some of these are small garage operations of three to five people. Some of them are you know, larger startups and they grow in size and eventually become acquired by a bigger company. So my transition in 2001 was joining one of these startups. I worked at a couple of them. I gathered some basic experience. I learned a lot about not just industry. I don't have any background in finance, for example. Uh, I don't have an MBA or a finance degree. So I was surrounded by people who knew this stuff much better than I did. So I learned from them uh, how to raise capital if in efforts like this, uh, how to present to people who are not necessarily in your field. This is something that some physicians do well, some uh, don't do that well because medicine and science are complex. So how do you actually present the arguments to lay people uh, in order to get them to partner with you in your enterprise, whatever that might be. So it was a very interesting voyage of discovery. So after two startups, I worked for three years at Johnson & Johnson and for the last 14 years, I've been at Abbott initially running clinical trials and now um, uh, heading global medical affairs in a division uh, within Abbott. So uh, have you noticed, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that one finds uh, the, dif the difference between academia and industry uh, with respect to research is that yeah. in academia, you are encouraged to publish uh, yeah. to the outside world. In fact, you, you are supposed to publish, especially yeah. entire journals. Whereas in industry, uh, the focus is more on patents, uh, which yeah. kind yeah. of uh, narrows down the reach of uh, uh, your uh, discovery. Yeah, it's an interesting distinction, but it's a distinct, uh, but I think the two uh, areas are getting closer. And one of the reasons for that is a lot of academics have started to patent and in industry, since industry started hiring people like me, not now, but you know, 20 years ago, we, we encourage our scientists and our physicians in industry to publish. So I continued to publish after the move from academia to industry. 
But in a sense, I regret having published a lot in academia without actually patenting some of those, uh, those interesting observations because then somebody else profits off something that you have discovered. So since a lot of students are listening to this talk, my message to them is, you know, think about both sides of the equation. Publications are important to get it out, but once it's in the public domain, it's very hard to patent it. So if your university has patent attorneys or you have access to them, talk to them first. And sometimes you can just file a provisional patent very quickly and then still um, you know, submit the abstract for presentation, present it. The publication path takes you know, six months, a year, 18 months sometimes anyway. So if you file your provisional patent up front, you're kind of protected uh, as you go along. You know, um, many of you don't know this, but Albert Einstein started his career at the Zurich Patent Office. Um, oh. <laughs> and he was very big on patenting because when he was a young 26 year old, thinking about, you know, E is equal to MC squared and other things, he, he actually had a day job in the Zurich Patent Office. So he was very aware of this. And when he taught at Princeton, this is what he taught his students. You may have a fantastic discovery, but if you don't patent it, you don't own it. And that's fine if you are of the view that it should belong to the world. But if you think that you should get credit for it and eventually profit from it, then you need to patent it. In fact, there's a famous story of uh, Watson and Crick presenting the double helix DNA model uh, at, uh, at Princeton. And turned out that there was an elderly gentleman with long white hair in the audience, and that was Albert Einstein. And he raised his hand and he only had one question. Okay, you guys have discovered DNA. Can you patent it? <laughs> Turns out, you know, it, it's something made by God, right? Uh, you can't patent it. That was the, the answer. But he wanted to know if it could be patented or not. That was the only question he had, okay. you know, that he posed to Watson and Craig. Okay. okay. So that's Very the story. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. You know, okay, my next question is the experience, because you continue to teach, even today, yep. you're a visiting yep. professor at Stanford and Berkeley. So uh, how has your experience now in industry uh, kind yep. of helping you to teach and connect yep. the student community? Yeah, so industry is a very broad term, right? So, and I didn't know this before I actually joined industry. So in industry, we have a number of departments in a company. So a big company like, you know, Abbott or Genentech or Merck or Bristol Myers Squibb, there's the research and discovery arm where you have a lot of extremely smart scientists who are creating, discovering, reading the literature all the time, bringing new things in. In, in the COVID uh, uh, context, for example, people are making new tests every day, making antibody tests, working on antiviral agents, working on eventually a vaccine. So hopefully some of these brilliant minds will get us out of this pandemic uh, and so on. Then the next thing is once R&D has made the product, then they throw it over the shelf to the <coughs> clinical who can test the product. Uh, actually, there's a preclinical group first that may test the plot product on the bench and in an animal model. And then there's a clinical group that tests it in humans. There's a regulatory group that is constantly talking to the FDA or the regulators in India or the regulators in China or Japan and, and Europe and so on, so that when the product moves along its life cycle, it can, be, it can come through the approval process. And then once it's approved, you throw it over the fence to the commercial guys who can then scale it up and then you know, bring manufacturing in so that you, know, you probably made uh, 200, 500 of these products for your clinical trials, but now you need 5,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million of these to commercialize. So you have to be talking to manufacturing people who can scale it up and then take it to full production. So that's the breadth of industry. Generally, physicians and scientists stay in that first part of the equation. We are on the R&D and clinical side. We're talking to the regulatory guys. We're talking to commercial guys. We're talking to manufacturing guys. But our comfort zone is in that R&D and clinical space. And that's where we make our, hopefully, we make our contributions in the commercial and R&D space. So when I go and teach at Stanford or at Berkeley, at Stanford, there are more tutorials. I teach uh, young cardiology fellows from all over the world, occasionally talk to bioengineering students. At Berkeley, I do classes to the graduate school in bioengineering, and they're interested in knowing how concepts evolve through you know, the industry life cycle and actually become realities. So a concept starts with you know, a, a drawing on the a back of a napkin, 
and then you develop this product concept. Uh, you shouldn't forget to patent it, otherwise you don't own it at all. And then you take that through, you, you probably make a few prototypes, you test it on the bench top, you test it in an animal model. And at some stage, given with all the quality controls in place, you're ready to transition um, to uh, a human experiment, if you like. Uh, this, this is true of drugs, this is true of a variety of medical devices and so on. So that's now my area of expertise. Um, I spent many years in academia where I did completely different things. I was looking at risk factors for cardiovascular disease. I looked at high blood pressure. I looked at hypercholesterolemia. I looked at antiplatelet therapy, looked at a variety of things. And we were going to talk about TED-Ed videos later on. A lot of my TED-Ed videos are around those topics, sort of the traditional cardiovascular medicine topic. But increasingly as a teacher, interestingly, at Stanford and Berkeley and, uh, and other universities, when I get invited, they want, to share, they want me to share my experience of a physician in industry. Uh, when I joined industry, uh, there were only a few of us around. It's getting more common because industry has learned that hiring physicians is a good thing. Uh, you know, we are people who've been in the trenches. We have treated patients. We've looked after patients. We have a better idea of perhaps of what patients need. So having a, a medical consultant within uh, the industry framework is sometimes a benefit. So it's a long answer to your question, but essentially the focus of my teaching tends to be these academia industry collaborations right. and how, how a physician in industry actually contributes to the development of products within industry. Okay, right. In fact, now we move to the next part of our conversation, which is very much connected to the academia industry interface. And uh, you know, you have actually witnessed and have been a part of the entire innovation engine that you see in the Silicon Valley. So uh, would I be uh, kind of right in saying that um, one of, you know, the first uh, component of, of the secret sauce of innovation in the Silicon Valley is academic industry interface. Absolutely, absolutely. So I was lucky, you know, uh, oftentimes in life, your path is directed by circumstance. So in the early 90s, I came to UCSF to do my cardiology fellowship and stayed on for a, an extended period of time. Uh, and I found myself, you know, by virtue of coming to uh, UCSF in the Silicon Valley. So you're surrounded by uh, tech companies, you're surrounded by biotech companies, you know, and you go to a barbecue on a Sunday. I mean, these are guys who invent stuff and patent stuff and, you know, are doing interesting stuff like this all the time. So it's a very uh, exciting milieu, a very exciting uh, environment. Now, there are a number of reasons why the Silicon Valley is extremely successful at what it does, why it produces, you know, in the high-tech sphere, uh, Google and and Facebook and uh, you know, uh, WhatsApp and you know, a, a thousand tech companies. And on the, uh, on the medical side produces companies like Genentech and Gilead and Abbott and so on, which have really contributed a lot to the world. I think though you, you said it, the, the, the crux of what makes the Silicon Valley different is there is a very close juxtaposition of three things. It's academia, industry and investment capital. So let's say you want to launch a startup company and some of the people in the audience have probably done it. You need, you need the idea first. The Silicon Valley has three major universities, Stanford, Berkeley, and UCSF. So UCSF and, uh, and Berkeley at the North, Stanford in the South. We have others as well, like Santa Clara University and so on. So there is a wealth of intellectual capital. These are bright people, bright students who come out of these universities. For example, Hewlett and Packard came out of the dorm in Stanford. Larry Page and Sergey Brin, who launched Google, came out of the dormitory at Stanford. In fact, I think they wrote their original patents when they were students at Stanford, and they wrote it when they were you know, together in the dorm. So that's the first thing, academia. The second is industry. There are you know, a thousand uh, biotech companies and several thousand high-tech companies in the area. The third is investment capital because people need to be ready to invest. So there is a street uh, in Silicon Valley. It's very close to Stanford. It's called Sand Hill Road. Some of you might have visited. Sand Hill Road has about, I don't know, four, four to $4.5 billion in investment capital that people are willing to dole out to good projects, right? So you might have to go to the big equity banks on the East Coast 
but you can probably raise a lot of capital here in, in, um, in Sand Hill Roads. For, so for a guy who wants to do a startup or a woman, I don't want to be sexist here, for an individual who wants to launch a startup, we've got the perfect confluence of the three. You've got the ideas coming out of the university. You've got the companies and the, you know, the, the uh, milieu to actually create the company. And you've got the investment capital with very smart venture capitalists who kind of can put the finger on you know, what's likely to succeed and what's not. I've presented many times to these guys and you start the conversation going some way. And when you come out 60 minutes later, you say, oh my God, he pushed me in a completely different direction that I was never thinking about. And it's because they've done it for the last 20 or 30 years and you can benefit from their experience. Okay. Okay. The next uh, point I'd like to uh, uh, discuss here is the second point of the secret sauce of innovation yep. in the Valley, yep. which is the ability of people to think out of the box. Yes. So can you give us examples from yep. different industries like IT industry, biotech industry, Hollywood? Sure, uh, you sure. Know, and uh, yeah. even- uh, About thinking, uh, thinking yeah. outside the box. Yes, of yeah. course. Yeah, so that's a very important uh, uh, component here. You may have challenges that you're facing and you, know, you have to be in a certain mindset to solve that problem, right? right? Einstein said, you can't solve a problem if you're in the same mindset you were when you created it. So you have to learn to think differently. And there are many, many examples of this. For if you, if you think of, uh, of the Apple Macintosh computer, right? That was designed by Steve Jobs and, and, uh, and Wozniak. I mean, it was a little skunk work project within the big Apple uh, um, setup, within the big Apple environment. And they had this little project where they're going to create this little box you know, the original Macintosh computer, given a little funding, it was thought to be a side project. And before you know, the tail is wagging the dog, right? So it was the out of the box thinking, why do we need these huge mainframes? Can we actually have a little computer on our desk? Now this is going back to the eighties. Uh, think of Amazon. Amazon was originally a company that uh, delivered books to your door. You know, So it was a bookstore online, right? And the guys who created Amazon realized we had a very good thing in this delivery system. So suddenly it, it became larger than just delivering books. It became a delivery company. So today books are a very small part of Amazon. Amazon will deliver practically you know, anything to your doorstep. I'll give you an example out of, uh, out of uh, uh, medicine, which, uh, which may uh, surprise you a little bit. A lot of uh, discoveries in medicine are serendipitous. So uh, there's a huge industry with, um, how shall I put this, sexual dysfunction. Uh, you know, family-friendly program, right? Sexual dysfunction. But the original uh, drug for this, and I see Dr. Sanjeev uh, laughing because this is his specialty, he's a urologist. The original drug was actually developed for treatment of heart disease, okay? Viagra was developed for treatment of chest pain and angina. But the scientists who were studying these patients realized that there was an interesting side effect going on. So they had the foresight to pick up the side effect and make it the main uh, sort of destination pathway of the drug. Another example, if you like, of out of the box thinking where you, you, you don't really dismiss something because it doesn't fit your plan. You ask yourself the question, does this other thing going on here actually make sense? And can I capitalize on this in order to move something else forward? So you may be, you may be in a completely different mindset, but if you keep your mind open to possibilities, you know, other things may develop that may take over the world in a completely unexpected way that, you know, was not originally intended. These, these accidents that happen when you're in the discovery process can actually be leveraged and converted into products that, you know, end up being extremely valuable to society or extremely valuable to the world, depending on your, uh, uh, you know, your, your approach to the problem. But you have to be in a ready frame of mind to accept it when something is not going well and you, you see something else is going well to actually move in that, uh, in that particular direction. And how about a couple of other industries like medical devices and Hollywood? The, you're yeah, very close yeah. to those places. Of course, yeah, yeah. So Hollywood is an interesting example. So my, my two sons work in Hollywood and they make movies there. Uh, they might be watching on the YouTube cha channel, you never know. So, sure. so Hollywood also, you know, has, has evolved over the years. And there are, there's one interesting example. There was a movie called Paranormal Activity, where, which was made on a university campus, I forget which one, uh, about 10 years ago, maybe. 
And uh, the, the guys on the university campus were basically having fun. They had a total budget of about fifteen or $16,000. To give you an idea, most Hollywood budgets start at a million upwards, maybe even 2.5 million upwards. And an expensive movie can be 75 million, 100 million US dollars. So they had a budget of 16,000 US dollars, but they decided to make a, a movie called Paranormal Activity, which was about ghosts. You know, ghosts in the building, ghosts on campus, a, a kind of a funny movie. Uh, so they used very cheap props, like, you know, a sheet tied to a piece of string and you drag it along and that's essentially a ghost. They advertised using very low budget advertising on university campuses. So whatever the prevailing social media was at the time, probably pre-Instagram and pre-Snapchat. So it was predominantly Facebook, perhaps putting up ads in the cafeteria and so on. And it took off on university campuses. And then suddenly at some stage, Steven Spielberg got interested. The franchise got sold, I think, eventually to Paramount. And the franchise ended up being worth, you know, close to a billion dollars. So you're starting with $16,000 and ending up with such a huge franchise because people were willing to put in some out of the box thinking, you know, not necessarily go for the big budget approach, think outside the box. What can we do here within our budget and kind of make it work, you know? Another example is this recent movie, Parasite, which won the, uh, mm. the Oscar uh, for best picture at, uh, at Hollywood at the, at the most recent Oscar award. You know, this is a South Korean movie about class differences in society and so on. The director was reasonably well known in South Korea, not so well known perhaps in the United States. He put together this brilliant film about you know, a wealthy family and a poor family and guess what, you know, a year later, he's walking up there receiving the Oscar. And you have to give credit to the Academy for at least now being a little bit open to these out of the box ideas mm -hmm. and give something that was not out of Hollywood, <clears throat> the biggest award in Hollywood. So thank you for asking me about that. Right. Okay. Now, uh, another unique aspect about the Silicon Valley is about diversity. Uh, yeah. You know, and how does diversity help spur innovation? Yeah. So when we think of diversity, you know, we can think of it in two, two separate boxes. <clears throat> One box is what we usually think of, and that is racial diversity, ethnic diversity, national diversity, and so on. So we are blessed in California and to some extent in the United States. You go to New York and Florida, most of the United States, we are blessed in having a multicultural, multiracial society, right? So you have the best and brightest people around the world. But what we have learned in the Silicon Valley and probably other people have learned elsewhere, you learn it in medical environments all the time, by bringing in people from diverse backgrounds, not only are you bringing in diverse ethnicities and diverse you know, uh, 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 people from diverse nationalities and so on, you're also bringing in diverse ways of thinking and cross-pollination between people who have different ways of thinking, different ways of problem solving is extremely important. For example, uh, not to uh, throw stereotypes around, but there may be some merit in it. Maybe we as Indians are more organized, more structured, our educational system is more structured and so on. Uh, there are aspects of the US system that are less well structured, but more open to creative thinking. So you put those two together, you put a person with a background like yours or mine, where you know we have been structured through our schooling and our university education and so on in our you know, bachelor's, master's, doctoral degrees and throw us together with somebody who has completely off the wall, out of the box ideas, you know, there's a synergy in that because the, the person with the off the wall uh, ideas may not be able to take them through to the next step because they have not learned the art of organized thinking. Whereas we have spent most of our life in a very traditional approach, learning the art of organized thinking. So you can see how that synergy can happen when you throw diverse populations of people together. So this has been recognized in the Silicon Valley. I think it's particularly well recognized in the IT industry, probably even over uh, you know, the medical industry and, and uh, either drug or, or device industry. We're, we're playing catch up. But in the IT sector, you know, it's dominated by people who've come in from India, from China, from other Asian countries like Taiwan and Singapore, from Eastern Europe, uh, Russia, the Ukraine, and so on. And these people have you know, cross-pollinated with uh, local Americans grown up here, I guess, and created these amazing enterprises. And this has now been recognized all the way up to the top. There are five major companies now in the United States 
where the CEO is of Indian descent. You have Google with uh, with um, uh, Sundar. Yeah, you have Microsoft with Satya Nadella. You've got uh, IBM, who now has an Indian CEO. You have Mastercard, which is not necessarily Silicon Valley, it also has an Indian CEO. And you've got Adobe, which has an Indian CEO. And there's probably many, many others. But these are five large companies in you know in in tech. Mastercard is, of course, you know tech and banking and so on, which have CEOs of Indian descent. So this is a recognition that bringing in diversity at all levels can really contribute to different ways of thinking moving things ahead in a way that would not have been possible with much more homogeneous thinking. I am convinced now, and I lead a very multicultural group. I think I have, uh, I have you know, 20 plus people in, in the group, uh, but we probably have people from 12 or 14 different backgrounds. So that the cross-pollination that's possible with these very diverse uh, backgrounds is pretty amazing and uh, has to be seen to be believed. <clears throat> Right. You see, another um, very important aspect of the secret sauce of innovation in the Silicon Valley is uh, the uh, ability of the Valley to kind of not only accept failure, but kind yep. of encourage failure. And, yep. uh, you know, there are several examples, including in your industry of stents, yep. uh, where yeah, the yeah. Zion stent went through some several iterations became it, yep. before it became a blockbuster. Can you tell yeah, us about yeah. this culture of failure in sure, uh, sure. the Valley? So again, those of us who are schooled in a traditional way, right? If we come from India or Singapore or Australia or Britain, countries with, with more traditional educational systems, uh, you know, you go through the motions, you try to be as good a student as you can be and so on. And there's nothing wrong in that. Academic excellence should be celebrated, of course. But uh, the, the, the point is that, uh, you know, educational systems um, um, have, to be, have to be flexible. Uh, just remind me of the question again, uh, Nile, I got a little distracted you, with the thought. You, uh, the ability to accept and encourage failures. Failure, exactly, exactly, failures. So students tra uh, trained in a traditional system, you know, the ability to accept failure is sort of very much in the background. It's, it's, uh, it's almost a no-no. On the other hand, when you launch a startup company, there is probably a nine in 10 chance, it may be even higher, that the company is going to fail. So um, uh, the success in Silicon Valley, particularly in the startup world, tends to be a small percentage of the total companies that are launched. But in Silicon Valley, we accept this. We accept that failure is the stepping stone to success. So if you work for a startup that failed and move on to your next startup and your next startup, you're wearing these as badges of honor because you've learned from your prior experiences what not to do. You know? uh, apparently, Thomas Edison filed thousands and thousands of patents on the electric bulb before he actually made the one that worked. So he said, if, he, if it takes you 10,000 steps to make the electric bulb, it doesn't mean that you failed 9,999 times. It means that you learned 9,999 things that you should not be doing on the way to making the one thing that works. So, uh, so like I said, we have a big tolerance to failure here. So take, take any company that's a household name. Take Tesla, for example. The initial models of the Tesla, there were these nightmare examples of it just stopping on the freeway and, you know, the engine cutting off and the, the driver not being able to drive any further. But Elon Musk, you know, was a, a dogged, tenacious, and they moved from one model to the next and they made the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the later models successful. Take space exploration, right? When you and I were students at Don Bosco, space exploration was just starting. I mean, in the 50s, the Russians had put Sputnik into space, the Apollo program was launched, 1969 when we were you know, young kids in school uh, landed on the moon, but they didn't get to the moon without some failures. In fact, there was this very tragic uh, Apollo test flight where three astronauts, Grissom, White, and Chaffee, were, were, were killed. Uh, if you look at uh, the Columbia experience in the 80s, there were at least two space shuttles, right, that burnt up. Uh, one, I think, burnt up immediately after launch, one burnt during re-entry, and this is, these failures are sometimes the price one pays for very daring exploration. Um, it's, it's also a uh, reflection of your, uh, 
propensity to take risk. In the Silicon Valley, we have a much higher appetite perhaps for risk. Uh, there is a, an experiment uh, which is uh, very interesting. And this was conducted on a, a colony of uh, baboons in a university in, on the East Coast which studies you know, behavior in baboons. And they're very similar to us humans. Um, they taught these monkeys on a computer to pick a red dot or a green dot. Now, if they hit the green dot, they got a jelly bean very reliably. You hit the green dot once, you get one jelly bean. And apparently monkeys love sweets. So, you know, the monkey is rewarded immediately. You hit the red dot, you may not get anything. But in random fashion, maybe on the 27th try or the 49th try, you get 100 jelly beans. Okay? <laughs> So this is risk taking. And apparently the colony separates roughly 98 and two. 98% of the monkeys go for the green dot because you want that one jelly bean every time. But 2% of the, of the monkeys will choose the red dot because they want the high risk, high reward. Okay. So a lot of our, our Silicon Valley CEOs belong to that 2% group. They're okay <laughs> with the high risk, high reward. While most of us, you know, are probably in the remaining 98% where we, you know, want to go step by step. And, and human behavior might be a combination at certain times in your life, you're probably more of a risk taker, maybe in your 20s, and then you need to have a steady career. And then maybe, you know, when we retire and we are in our 60s and 70s, we can come back to risk taking and do our own startups. I don't know, you see. So this, this is not, I don't know if it's innate or acquired. And I believe it can change in various phases in life. Okay, right. Uh, the next point is uh, the kind of uh, structure of the organizations which are there in Silicon Valley, very unique structures as compared to the older industries, the smokestack industries. Uh, right. We find them absolutely no hierarchy, yep. teamwork, uh, you know, and, and that in turn results in so much of innovation, not just in IT industry or biotech industry, but even companies like Pixar, which have yes. managed to come out with blockbuster movies. Yes. Uh, yep. But the structure of the organization is extremely flat. Uh, what do you have yep. to say yep. about that? Uh, it's an extremely important point. So generally, the smaller the company, the less the hierarchy. And you find that as the companies grow in size, when they become acquired, when they start to be merged and brought into the larger organization, you see more structure and more hierarchy. But in the startup environment, you know, anybody can talk to anybody. So the junior most engineer in the company is often able to talk to the CEO because these companies might only have 10 people or 50 people or 75 to 100 people. So I think that uh, free flowing dialogue between junior people, mid-level managers and senior people is extremely important to move an idea along rapidly. In Pixar, apparently that there, there is a rule that before the final cut is done, you have to make sure that you've read the notes of everybody who's been involved in the project. And one of the reasons their movies like uh, Ratatouille or Coco or, you know, their, their movies are so successful, the whole Toy Story series, is probably because of this attention to detail where anybody can point out anything during the process of making these movies. And I think that's what ends up with such a successful product. We see that a lot in the R&D sector in, in uh, the Silicon Valley where you know, there's free flow of communication. Uh, you see iterations much faster. You see modifications of ideas so that you may have six people coming at it from six different angles, but then they talk to each other very quickly, get the idea moving forward, and then you can go on to the next step. So I think it's important. You, you need some hierarchy when you get to a, a, a more advanced level of a company because now you're starting to deal with regulators, you're planning commercialization, you have to think about manufacturing and scaling up and so on. But at the early stages, you really don't want these uh, hierarchical approaches. You want free flow of information between people involved in the project. Okay, now let's move to the next part of the discussion, which is the uh, TED-Ed, uh, which yep. you uh, have often, and you have many videos on TED-Ed. Now, for the benefit of the audience, uh, all of you must have heard of TED Talks. TED Talks is a very reputed organization uh, where they have reputed speakers who speak. And there are subdivisions of TED Talks. One of them is TED Ed, that is uh, TED for Education. So uh, Sudhir has been, uh, uh, you know, kind of speaking and preparing videos on various topics of healthcare 
like for example, a heart attack uh, or aspirin. And these are all for the public, for the layman, what you should do, what you should not do. And um, Sudhir, can you tell us about your passion for kind of educating the masses about these aspects? Sure. So uh, uh, briefly a word about TED, TED-Ed. So everyone's familiar with TED Talks, as you say, but there is a division of TED that creates educational videos. And this is called TED-Ed. Initially, it was targeted to high school and college students. They tended to be the major consumers of TED-Ed, but it's become so popular. And I think they've got about 12 million subscribers that come from all walks of life. So uh, a couple of years ago, I started working with them, maybe three years ago now. And uh, it takes about eight months, sometimes 10 months to create a video. Uh, so essentially as the educator, I write a script, they assign me an animator. They assign me first an editor who works with me on the script. Then they assign an animator, they hire a voice actor to do the voices. And then we put the production together. So it's like creating a movie. They're, they're only about four or five minutes long. The first one I did was heart attacks. And then, as you said, I did aspirin. I did one on uh, smoking and the benefits of quitting. I'm currently working on one on yoga, which will be released in the next couple of months that has a lot about the discovery of yoga in India and the health benefits of yoga, something that I uh, am a fan of and believe in. Um, so, um, and the videos get lots and lots of views. So one thing I learned is, you know, I, I speak a lot at uh, medical conferences and uh, perhaps the largest audience I've had was a few years ago at, uh, at the American College of Cardiology meeting where there were maybe I was presenting a new technology and maybe, the, maybe there were about thousand people in the room. So I thought, wow, this is a huge audience. But that heart attack video has been watched by 3.5 million people. Ooh. So your ability to reach people is much, much higher in this medium, uh, you know, social media. The anti-smoking me uh, video, I think has reached 4.2 or 4.3 million people. I could never imagine that size of an audience in a room, right? However large the room is. Even in a football stadium, I mean, if you're, if you're speaking to people in a football stadium, maybe 85,000, maybe Eden Gardens, Calcutta would be what, 120,000 or something like that. But that pales in comparison to having an audience of two, three, four, five million. And I think that's the power of, uh, of uh, social media. So something I think in this current educational environment to talk, uh, to think about, I've been very uh, intrigued by, uh, by the TED organization and their ability. TED stands for technology, education, and design. And essentially they got very popular with the talks, but there are so many spin-offs now of the TED organization that are uh, pretty amazing. I think they have these local things called TEDx that you can do in your uh, neighborhood. And then these TED Ed videos happen to be a more visual component of, uh, of their education. Now, I have shown those heart attack and uh, anti-smoking videos to as young as five-year-olds and to elderly people in their 80s and 90s. And people, you know, they're animated videos with a voiceover and so on. And people take what they can get because the medium is so strong, right? So a five-year-old watches it and is taken up by the animation. And something registers even in the five-year-old mind. Obviously, somebody more mature gets a lot more out of them. But it's like watching an animated film with your, with your daughter, Nilay. And what she gets out of it is very different from what you get out of it. But each one is getting something of value. Right. So, uh, you know, in, in fact, the whole audience here, um, if you wish to, in fact, you should view some of his educational videos, like uh, the video on heart attack uh, or, uh, you know, aspirin and others. Uh, they're short videos. You can just Google. They're all open source videos. So you just uh, kind of Google Ted Ed, Dr. Krishna Sudhir, uh, and you'll find his videos there. Very interesting videos. I've seen them myself. And it will help all of you uh, maintain a good, healthy lifestyle. Okay, Hopefully. my next uh, uh, point is something a little different, which is uh, uh, despite your busy schedule of uh, leading a top uh, multinational company division, uh, your teaching uh, interest, academia interest, um, you still have a, you have a passion for writing and uh, you write fiction books. Uh, yep. I know your mother is a very famous author. Uh, she's an award-winning author, Dr. Geeta Krishnan Kutti. And um, she has received awards like the Katha Award, the Crossword Award, a very well-known translator who translates regional language 
uh, literature into English. Um, and so have you kind of inherited this passion for writing uh, from your mother? Yeah, I think the, you know, one of the biggest gifts you get, right, is the genes from your parents, right? Uh, you have little control over that. And when it works out, uh, you know, in a, in a nice way, it's pretty awesome. So uh, dad was a physician. Uh, he, I think he gave me a lot of the left brain, so to speak, you know, with the science and the, uh, the approach to uh, problem solving and things like that. Mom was interested in literature, music, and so on. Introduced me to Simon and Garfunkel when I was in school. Uh, her mom, my grandmother, was actually one of Kerala's first translators. And she translated in the reverse direction. She translated books like Jane Eyre, Silas Manor, Anna Karenina, the, the Russian novel by Dostoevsky, into Malayalam. That's My mother seemed to have inherited the talent and took it to a, a whole new level. And she translates the other way. She translates Malayalam novels into English. And as you've rightly pointed out, has a number of awards, including a Sahitya Academy Award for translation. So, uh, you know, uh, from, from an early age, we were interested in multiple things. But one of the things that you're interested in kind of take ho takes hold of your life. And in my case, it was science and medicine. So you get to your 50s, you know, I'm not revealing, we're not revealing our age here, right? Nila? You get to, to your 50s and then you think, what about all these other interests that we have? You know, what's going to happen to the music, the writing, the interest in, in um, certain landscapes, maybe some, some of you like art and painting and so on. So in my case, I always wanted to write novels. Uh, I was a huge fan of uh, reading when I was young. And as my two boys were, were growing up, we were huge fans of Harry Potter. So I got sucked into the world of fantasy fiction with the seven Harry Potter novels, the eight Harry Potter films. And I decided that my first stab at writing was going to be in the fantasy fiction genre. So I wrote a book, it's called Nujran and the Monks of Mirar. It's, uh, I'll, I'll do a little plug for it. It's available on Amazon. And it was published two or three years ago, and it's done reasonably well out there. And I thought I would convert it to a trilogy. I think you mentioned that at the start of the show. So I've written the second book now and submitted it for publication. It'll be out in the June, July timeframe. It's actually the sequel. So in the first book, you know, we, we have a young prince. He grows up on a planet in a distant galaxy. Uh, he's a bit of a spoiled brat. And then he meets this teacher who's actually kind of like an Indian god with four arms and so on. He wanders around the planet with this teacher. He has uh, brave new experiences, grows up into a, a young teenager through these experiences. Uh, and we leave him at the end of the first book, you know, as this more mature teenager, if you like. The second novel starts with him on a university campus and we follow him through his adventures at the university campus. And because I spent a lot of time at Stanford and Berkeley and you know, uh, my younger son was at USC. You'll actually see features of these three campuses in the book that one may or may not recognize. And then hopefully in the third and final uh, uh, book of the trilogy, you know, there'll be, there'll be some uh, conclusion with, uh, with this uh, individual either growing up or maybe, you know, coming back to the throne of his original, uh, uh, of his place of origin, et cetera. I haven't planned the third book as yet. But the transition was, uh, was interesting because in science and medicine, you have to stick to the fact, you know? Every, every line of those TED-Ed videos is fact-checked. You know, you, you can't just be like Trump, say whatever com that comes into your head, right? I mean, if you, if you put out something there on the TED-Ed video, it's been checked multiple times by the wonderful fact-checkers in the TED-Ed organization. Science is like that too. When you write a paper, you have some, uh, some leeway, I guess, in the discussion section when you can interpret the paper, but you present the facts as they are. You present the, uh, the hypothesis, the, the statistical analysis, the conclusion, you present as they are. Literature and fiction are completely the opposite, right? So you can, you can go into this world of fantasy, you can create things that don't exist because in a sense, you as the writer are the master, you're the controller, right? You're creating this new universe that doesn't exist. So for me, it was extremely liberating to create an essentially new universe. Uh, and, and you know, you have to, you have to let your uh, imagination wild. Um, uh, living in California, we are fans of, uh, of good, good wine. We have excellent wineries in the, in the region. 
and so on. So you have half a glass of wine with your dinner in the evening. You know, you're feeling mellow. Your your mind is in a good uh, uh, position, and then you start writing. And then you know you just write because it's a right brain activity. It is creative activity. And the next morning you come back to it, or days later you come back to it to edit because you shouldn't do both of them together. You confuse the brain. You know, one is a right brain activity, one is a left brain activity. So you create. And then you come back and edit later. In fact, Ernest Hemingway said it best, but he put it rather crudely. He said, write drunk, edit sober. I don't go that far. I just, you know, a half a glass of wine will do it. And then you write. Or if, if you get the same thing on coffee or tea or, you know, just having a samosa may, may let the creative juices flow. Who knows? Who knows what does it for you, right? So that, that was the transition from science and medicine to creative writing, something that I've really thoroughly enjoyed. And I recommend it for all your students, you know, whatever their creative passion might be, whether it's a musical instrument, song, dance, literature, art, you know, don't let that fall by the wayside. Or if you do, because of, you know, the, the, the structure you have to go after building a career and so on, you can always return to it uh, later in life. You know, you can come back to those creative passions later in life. Right, right. Okay, uh, I'd like to throw open the uh, platform for questions from the audience. Uh, Dinesh, will you please moderate? Sure, sir. I think you need to raise your hand. Dinesh, can you just explain, please? Sandeep, sir, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, Professor Sudhir, I have a question for you. Uh, you have been working at Abbott uh, for quite a long time and a lot of uh, medicine related innovations happen. And uh, the, there is a, a question of intellectual property, <clears throat> yep. uh, but does this get uh, impacted by the political pressure? So for example, right now there is a lot of debate about the vaccine research that is going on. Uh, uh, although uh, IP has a lot of provisions where government cannot interfere easily, uh, yep. but and it is the companies like Abbott and the BMS and others, uh, probably they will come up with something, but is there a government pressure uh, on the- uh, Well, uh, so yes and no. Let me uh, introduce yeah. you. Dr. Yeah. Sandeep Patel yeah. is heading our chemistry uh, department. Ah, okay, great, yeah. So intellectual property is supposed to safeguard the researcher, right? Safeguard yeah. the researcher, safeguard the company so that you own the property. Political pressure comes in, uh, you know, at various levels. It it may be, and it can go in both directions. It may it may delay the launch of a product, or it may accelerate it. You may have read that uh, in the COVID era, because the world is really waiting for tests for antiviral treatments and for potential vaccines. Chances are that the regulators are going to accelerate a lot of these uh, and make it a little bit easier. But there have been situations where you know, things have been slowed down as well. And it kind of depends on, you know, what's in, in the public's mind. I remember in the early, when I first came to the US, HIV or AIDS was very much in, the, uh, uh, in, in front of the public and AIDS drugs got through much faster than drugs say for cancer or drugs for heart disease uh, because it was perceived by society that such a deadly disease should have a lot of attention paid to it and therefore the FDA made it a little bit easier to move things forward. I don't think it affects your ability to patent because that's a separate thing with the US patent office or with international patents. So that really shouldn't be affected by the situation that depends on how the examiners view your patent, patents and so on. But it does affect the uh, speed at which you can bring something to the market, you know, having developed it, the, uh, the political climate Surrounding, um, surrounding something of that nature. One thing we've noticed it is that in the medical industry, we are always a lot slower, slower than the IT industry, right? Uh, if you have an idea at Facebook, you can, you know, in six days, it could be a product on Facebook, right? Whereas yeah. for us in the medical device world, it could take 18 months, two years, three years to bring out a product. And in the drug industry, it takes a lot longer than that because you have to do now large scale trials, so for a blockbuster drug to come out onto the market, it could take seven to 10 years. So there are huge discrepancies or differences uh, at the speed to market in various different industries. 
Okay. Thank you. I think uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Sanjeev Bundy, uh, I think you were from Australia. I think uh, Dinesh, he was trying to say something. Uh, can you kindly unmute him? Yeah. Uh, just a minute. You're muted, sir. We'll just yeah. unmute you. Dinesh, please unmute Dr. Sanjeev Bundy. Just a minute, sir. Still yeah, muted. No problem. Sanjeev Bundy, Dr. Sanjeev. Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead, sir. So, so they, yes. Any, any Hello. of, any of us in your first book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole range of characters in the first book. So I will. Um, any resemblance to any person living or dead is purely coincidental. That's my. No, statement. no, I can. Be, I think <laughs> I've, I've noted about eight people in that. Very good, very good. No. You're a smart guy. Yeah, you're a smart guy. <laughs> Obviously, uh, obviously, any writer will tell you, and you're a writer yourself, Sanjeev. You base you base characters, places around things that you know, right? So most writers will start off with writing about environments and people they know. Obviously, you change the character, you change disguise the environment a little bit uh, because you're writing fiction. But uh, nine times out of ten, uh, characters that you write about in fiction may bear some resemblance to, you know, uh, people, situations, circumstances, places that that one knows. Now you yeah, can yeah. take take that to a different level, of course, by uh, by by twisting and you know going into uh, new areas and so on. But essentially, there's some truth in that. They're better okay, avatars of the same people we knew. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bundy. Flexibility. Any, uh, Dinesh, Tejal. any other question? Uh, Tejal, ma'am? Yes, uh, Dr. Sudhir. First of all, what a fascinating life and what an inspiring journey so far. Thank you. So many talents, diverse talents, so many achievements. How do you manage all of this? And what is the level of discipline that you have in your daily life? I think this will inspire us and our students. So my second question is that, uh, you know, you will know Harari in his book, uh, 21 Lessons, uh, talks about uh, biotech. Now mm -hmm. with COVID, of course, healthcare too, being uh, very important uh, in the decades uh, that will come up. Uh, what would be your advice uh, to a university like ours, which is uh, preparing students and professionals for the future. What kind of courses or where should be, where should our uh, focus lie? Two questions. Okay. Thank you. Both are, both are good questions. So uh, let me start with the first question. The first question is about time management, right? So we all want to do a number of different things, but there are so many, only so many hours in the day. Most of us need about seven or eight hours of sleep so that if you subtract that from 24 hours, you have about 16 hours left. You need some time you know, to go to work, you need some time to eat, and you don't have a lot of time left. So I'll give you one example that might illustrate uh, you know, uh, perhaps uh, ways of managing one's time. So as part of my job at Abbott, and, and I've written this in the preface of the first book, I travel around the world. There's a lot of global travel involved. I come to India, I go to Australia, I go to Europe, uh, I'm in Singapore a lot because our Asia PAC head office is there. You have to go to Japan. So the point I'm trying to make is a lot of these are very long flights. So San Francisco, Singapore, for example, is a 16 hour flight, right? So I need eight hours of sleep. So you, you, know, you have eight hours, eight hours of waking time on these flights. Maybe you spend an hour or two you know, eating and then maybe you spend two or three hours doing your work. You're creating slides for the conference, conference you go to you still have about four or five hours left. And most of us would watch a movie. I certainly watched a lot of movies on my flights, but then I decided when I uh, wanted to write the novel, look, there's a lot of time to write in the sky. And it's a perfectly, it's a beautiful place to write in because you're isolated, the phone doesn't ring, it's very quiet uh, and you can think. So the entire first novel, and actually I'd say 90% of the second novel was written in the air. Now, because of COVID, I'm not flying temporarily. Post COVID, it'll start up again. But here's, here's an interest, my interesting approach to time management in that situation was, I don't have to, time to write in my daily life because there are so many other things I have to do, but I can write on my flights. 
And that's what ended up actually giving birth to two novels, if you like, uh, all that air travel. The second question, you know, what is the best advice to students on what to choose? Uh, obviously, the, the cliched answer to that is follow your passion, you know. And there is some truth in that because uh, was it Mark Twain? Somebody once said, if you enjoy what you do, then you'll never work a day in your life, right? Because it's all fun. So there's some truth in, in that. Choose a profession that you're interested in. Your, your heart is in it. You know, from the age of six, I wanted to be a physician. So that was not a difficult uh, choice for me. Uh, however, you know, also have a look at, since I'm talking to students here, have a look at what's out there, what's changing fast. You know, technology is changing fast. We are in the era of video communication. Uh, obviously, industries that, that can cater to this new environment of, of uh, uh, distance learning, distance education, the ability to communicate with each other across the planet are going to do very well. The earth is extremely concerned about climate change, global warming and things like that. Environmental industries are going to do very well. I think healthcare will always do well, but the healthcare sector is changing because we need we need more innovation, we need answers to pandemics, but we also need to uh, scale up quickly. And old ways of thinking may not work in situations where you have to scale up very quickly. Uh, take a situation, I mean, most of the world doesn't have enough uh, protective equipment, right? PPE and masks. Um, so uh, awareness of what the current problems are when carving out a career for oneself in the future you know, is, uh, is very important. You have life sciences people on campus. Uh, we've sort of answered a lot of the questions in heart disease. Obviously there's more of a ways to go, but if I was a young physician in my twenties now, or a young scientist, I'd be focusing on cancer and immunology because these are two areas where we're barely scratching the surface. You know, the cure to cancers, most cancers is going to come in the 21st century. A lot of those answers are going to come from immunology perhaps. So a focus on immunology and approaches to cancer in your more scientifically inclined students, I think is going to go a long way in problem solving for the 21st century. So think about the big problems of the 21st century, the big unanswered <laughs> communication. I think we're still scratching the surface. We're getting better and better at it. Uh, issues, And then in, in the healthcare sector, sort of answering big questions like cancer, depression, dementia and Alzheimer's disease for which, you know, there are no uh, good answers that medicine has to offer today, but hopefully in the next 25, 50, 100 years, we'd be uh, approaching these with, uh, with much greater confidence and much greater gusto, if you like. Basu, sir. Yeah. Uh, once again, I have only one comment to make and one question to ask. The comment that uh, it's simply, if I, in one sentence, if I want to say, it's mesmerizing. Your talk has been highly motivational, tremendously powerful, dynamic. And I am sure that not only all of us, including the students, have got a lot of things from you. You spoke about innovation and it was rightly tickled by Dr. Yagnik, the right place. He has asked, uh, asked the question. As I was, some, I was taking down some of the notes, I find innovation, which is the key thing for today. That is the thing you have touched very, very nicely. And people and the students will be benefited out of it. It's a terrific speech. You were such a great orator that in the beginning of the program, he told me, told. So that is one. The question, if I have to ask one question, very obvious question, because you yourself is a doctor, you said, and we can find out that you said both the right and left brain combination. So an ordinary person like us, when today we are having an extremely difficult time, as a doctor, as a right brain, as a left brain, as a combination, what is your suggestion, your recommendation to us? How we can conquer COVID? So, uh, you know, it's an interesting fact. And if you talk to most neurologists, they'll tell you that we are only using small portions of our brain uh, at a time, right? There is a huge amount of reserve in the brain that for mo most of us go through life without tapping it, myself included, and most of us in this audience included. So the brain has enormous potential. Now, did Einstein really have a more superior brain or did he just use it more than all of us with his imagination? There's a great quote from him which said, imagination is more important than knowledge, right? 
So you can sit in an armchair, imagine, and you can bring an entire universe. I mean, the best example of that is Stephen Hawking, right? The man was in a wheelchair from the age of 30 till literally the day he died, the age of 76. But he imagined all these worlds. He imagined the Big Bang. He imagined the universe at its conception. He talked about multiverses. This is a man with an unlimited imagination, even though his physical body was trapped in a wheelchair. So I think, again, in the, in the spirit of talking to students here, you know, um, you have to let your imagination go wild. You have to move into new dimensions because these are the people who change the world, right? People with, with uh, imagination that, uh, that is beyond what most of us have. Take somebody like Steve Jobs, and I recommend to you some of, his, uh, some of the movies that were made out of him. This is a guy who had a concept that you know, one day you would have a phone about this size, you know, about the size of two credit cards on which you could not only make a phone call, but it's a little mini computer. There's more computing power in, in this than what put man on the moon, come to think of it. And this was the concept that this was imagined by an individual when it was completely non-existent. And he took that imagination, he talked to a number of very smart engineers, T. Wozniak being one of them, created the company, took it through to completion, and you have products that have dominated, dominated the world uh, because of a very imaginative. Admittedly, he was a difficult man to work with. Uh, that's well known in the Silicon Valley. But he was the man with limitless imagination. And look where it has uh, taken us today. So I think that's, that's a good message for the students, I think. Let your imagination fly. OK, there are a lot of questions. But uh, let's understand it's nearing midnight for uh, Sudhir. So uh, I guess uh, there is one question from Dr. Rajesh Jain, uh, who is a professor at the Nirma University um, in Ahmedabad. Uh, Dr. Jain, would you uh, like to ask your question, please? Dr. Jain? Rajesh Jain? Okay, sir, I'll just read out his question from the chat box. Sure. What could be done to leapfrog as a nation for creating a mark in the globe, like that of Silicon Valley? Your prescription yeah. to us in general and to the academia in particular. Yeah, so this is a good question. When I, uh, uh, many, many years ago, I was part of a group in Silicon Valley that actually talked to people coming in from other countries and the main question we got was, how can we recreate the Silicon Valley in our countries? So for example, if you're trying, if you're the government of Singapore and trying to set up a Silicon Valley there, or you're the government of Abu Dhabi and trying to set it up there, or in a huge country like India, you know, with 1.2 billion people, can you create multiple Silicon Valleys? And I think it speaks to, to some of what Nile and I discussed earlier. It's a culture. It's not, it's not one thing, it's not one secret, it's a culture that has to be developed. There has to be sufficient encouragement for brave new ideas, thinking outside the box. There has to be tolerance for failure. There has to be an acceptance of diversity because different people will bring, bring different things to the table. We, we may not be able to eliminate hierarchy. Our society, I know I grew up in India, our society is pretty hierarchical, but in the context of innovation, Less hierarchy is good, allowing people with bold new ideas to actually bring them forward. And I think this combination of uh, features, I think, is what could you know, put uh, India up there. And there are several examples where this has already been done in industry in India, where a lot of brave <clears throat> concepts have come out of the Indian innovative environment. I think we just have to, to create that foundry in our university settings, in our uh, company settings in India. Um, and allow, I think, this sort of uh, synergy between youthful imagination and, you know, the maturity of experience. It can form a good synergy to take it to the next level. You know, when Larry uh, uh, Page and Sergey Brin created Google, they brought in a very experienced CEO when Google reached a certain size because they knew they didn't have the wherewithal to take it to the next level. So they brought in maturity at that level. So it's, it's not one is better than the other. You need both. You need youth and you need experience. You need that synergy to take it to a bold new level. And universities have both by definition, right? 
So these things can be done on universities campus campuses. Universities can be incubators for creativity. Uh, most of the startups in Silicon Valley in the early days came out of Stanford and Berkeley and UCSF and Santa Clara University for that reason, because you know you had that good combination around. Okay, I think uh, because as I said, you no, know, it's nearing midnight for Sudhir. Um, um, Mrs. Tejal Amin, would you like to uh, uh, give your comments? No, I don't think um, connectivity sometimes is an issue. Anyway, sure. uh, okay, so uh, I guess we can end the discussion uh, here right now. And um, on behalf of the Navarachana University, uh, I wish to thank you, uh, Dr. Krishna Sudhir, for spending so much of your time with all of us. It was a fascinating session um, and uh, all of us enjoyed it, students, faculty, all of us. And uh, we had a great audience from around the world who was listening today. And uh, we really look forward to your coming here personally because you do visit India very frequently. And uh, next time you visit uh, India, please do come to our university, be our guest. Thank you, Nilay. I enjoyed it as much. Uh, I enjoyed it very much and hopefully your students did too. So thank you for the invitation and we will be in touch. Thank you so much. Bye, okay. Bye, -bye. and good night. Bye -bye. Thank you.